Hey everybody, this is Access Jitsu. Welcome to our video on the VBA needed to compact and prepare Microsoft Access databases. Compacting and repairing is a maintenance task we want to perform every couple of weeks to make sure that our database is in good working order and that and to minimize and to minimize the risk of database corruption. But two scenarios. We have a split database with a front end database on multiple users desktops and a back-end database on a shared location they all are linking to. If this user decides to press the compact and repair button on his or her ribbon, it's going to compact and repair his or her front-end only. However, arguably the more important database to compact and repair is going to be your back-end database that holds your data that all these people are linking to and modifying data, adding and subtracting data from. It's the one that really is going to need your maintenance. Wouldn't it be nice to be able to have a button on one of these or on all of these front ends that when you press it, it compacts and repairs that back end database. Another scenario would be if you have an administrative database that's responsible for monitoring multiple back end databases. You could log into each database separately and compact and repair each one, or you could have a button in your admin database that can do that for you. Very convenient. So again, welcome and thank you for joining us for our video on the Visual Basic needed to compact and repair and access database. So before we get into the code, let's discuss what it is we're talking about when we say compact and repair database. It is a maintenance task that Microsoft Access gives us to keep our databases healthy. One of the things compact and repairing does for us is it reorganizes or reorgs our indexes for greater efficiency. Indexes have uh, lots of records, and, uh, or even you call them leaf nodes, if you will. Uh, and as you add and subtract records from a database, these leaf nodes become unbalanced, and reorganizing them uh, increases the speed the database is able to find the records it's looking for, uh, you know, traverse that structure, if you will. Another thing compact repairing does for us is it reclaims empty space in our database. In addition to adding records for databases, we also delete records and Access actually creates temporary objects for us and deletes them on its own. In both of these cases, when these items are deleted, even though the, uh, the items themselves, the objects themselves are gone, the space they occupied is still there and taking up disk space and making your database larger than you would expect it to be based on the data that you've added. So compact and repairing can reclaim that space and make your database file smaller. A smaller database file is quicker to open and quicker to access. Another thing we get out of compact and repairing is when you share a database, as is in the case of a split database, you have if you have multiple people sharing and linking to that same backend database, there is a slight uh, increase in the risk of corruption of that database and compact and repairing um, every couple of weeks can decrease that risk. So let's take a quick look at our database before we get into the code. We have a split database configuration we're going to work with today. This is our front end database. There are three tables in our back end database, so three link tables here, and we have a form. This form has one function. It's not bound to any table. All it has is a button on here. It will compact and repair our linked back end database. Before we get into the code, let's talk about the things we want to do in our code to successfully compact and repair our backend database. Now, there is a single line of code that performs the compact and repair. However, I want to provide a more or less functioning example for you, and I think there are a few more things we want to do in order to use that one line of code to compact and repair. In order to compact and repair a database file, you have to have exclusive access to that database file, and that means you can be the only, you have to be the only person logged into that database. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to look at all the forms that are in the front end we're currently using to do the backup, and make sure that all of those forms are closed, except for the one that has our compact repair button on it. Okay, any of our any of the forms in our front end database that are bound to that back end database. That will prevent us from performing the compact repair because we won't have exclusive. It, it will think we won't have exclusive access to the to the backend database. And in addition to that, we want to make sure 
that the form that has our compact repub button on it does, is not bound to that backend database. Next thing we'll do is we need the full path to the backend database. We need the full file name to the backend database. We also want to make sure that we have, again, exclusive access to the database. So we're going to look at the locking file. We're going to look for a locking file for the database, a .laccdb. If that exists, we know that somebody else is logged into that backend but can't continue with our compact and repair. To rename our backend database file before we compact and repair it. And the reason for this is the structure of the compact and repair um, method. It takes a source file name and a destination file name. And the reason it does this is so that you don't lose your copy of your backend database if there's an error during compact and repair. So the source file remains unmodified, and the destination is a file name that shouldn't exist, and you can pack into it. So we're going to take our backend database and change the name of it, and then use that and compact into the original name. And if there's a problem, we'll still have that backup copy, that renamed copy that we can revert to. Next, we'll actually perform the compact and repair. Then we'll test our results. If we were successful, we can delete that backup copy we just created, or keep it if you'd like, if you want to keep that for a couple days or a couple weeks, just in case users have problems later on. If we have an error during compact and repair, we can take our renamed file and rename it again back to the original backend name. And that will allow the front end that you're using to get back into the database. So back into our database. Here's our form with our compact and repair button on it. Let's go over to our code. We have here, command compact underscore click this is the code that will execute on the click event of that button. So the first item on our to-do list is to close all the forms in our front end to make sure that we don't have any forms bound to that back end database opened, because that will again prevent us from being able to compact or repair. So we're going to get the forms.count from our front end database. We're going to subtract one from it and put it into this integer variable. We're going to subtract one from a because we're using, we're going to use it in a FNX loop on a collection that is zero based. Okay, uh, and here is our for loop. We're going to uh, loop through all the forms in our database uh, for int index equals the count we just came up with down to zero. Our step is a negative one. We're going to we're going to count backwards down to zero on this one. So for each form in the collection, we're going to test the name of the form and see if it is the name of the form that has our compact and repair button on it. That's the one form we don't want to close. Okay, And again, we're making sure that that form does not bind to our backend database, so it's okay to leave open. But all the other forms we might find, we want to make sure that they are closed. Next on our to-do list is to get the full path to our backend database. I have written a function that's going to perform that for us and it's going to put the full path into this string variable. Now, I'm using a little bit of trickery here because I also want this function to return a second value. I want it to return the database password. And we're going to put that in this variable here, dbpwd. Now this, uh, some people might, some purists might say this is a bad idea, having a function return two values. What I'm using here is the default method of uh, variable passing in access, passing variables by reference, meaning we have a variable here we're passing in, and if this function modifies this value, this variable inside of it, when you pass by reference, this actual variable in our calling code will be modified. The reason I'm doing that is the loop inside this function um, is very convenient for us to get the password at the same time when we find the, the full path. The other variable we pass in is the name of a table. Right, see this guy over here? A name of a link table that's in the back end. So let's go down to cur back end and have a quick look at it. Here we are, cur back end. Here's our function declaration. It takes table name as an input and db password as an input. And uh, as an input, db password, this string is going to be empty. We'll fill it later. We're going to set the value. The value of our function is a string. Uh, if it returns a string, we're going to set that value to, do, to a, a zero length string at first. We have a for each uh, next loop here. We're going to loop 
we're going to loop through all the table definitions in our database. Now some of those table definitions will be system tables and some will be the link tables in our backend database. So we are going to loop through all these table definitions looking for the table name we passed in. And we'll do that with this in-string function here. tdf.name will be the name of the table. The table name we passed in is inside TDF name. We found our table entry that we want to work with. TDF connect is the connection string for that table. We're going to put that whole thing into string path so we can begin working with it. We're going to set length length path, which is the length of our path, to the length of that string. Next, we're going to look in the connection string for database equals this string right here. That tells us that the, the characters or the string that follows is the full path to that backend database. So we're going to use the end string to find the starting position of our path. And then we'll put that path into this variable, curve backend. Actually, this is the value of our function. And next, and this is why I wanted to, to do both of these things in this one function. In order to get to the password, we have to go through this same loop. In my opinion, I don't want to have two function calls that do virtually the same thing. I like the idea of looping through these tables one time and getting both the path and the password at the same time. So after we've gotten our path, we're going to look for the string PWD in our connection string. And we're going to put the starting position of that in this variable J. Next, we're going to look for a colon that follows that. So in your connection string, you'll have PWD equals whatever your password is, and then a colon followed by probably your file name, database equals. So we're looking for, we look for the start of PWD plus four, because it'll be PWD equals. So four will be the starting position of your password. We'll look for the, the colon that follows it, get the position of that, and then we can extract from the string path just the password. Now, after we've gotten that, we want to go ahead and get out of our loop. There's no point in continuing to go through this loop and looping through all the tables in our database. We got what we want, so we can get out of our function. Let's go back to our calling code. Okay, so that was here. So now we're going to test the value returned in string database name. Remember, we set it equal to a zero length string at the beginning of the function. And if we found our table, we put the path in there. So we're going to test to see if it's zero length or not. If it's zero length, we're going to give a message box to our user saying that we had a problem. And then we're going to get out of our code and not attempt to do the compact and repair. Next, we're going to pass control to another method. I split our code up into two methods, two larger methods here, just to decrease the size of them. We're going to pass in a compact database, the full path or database, and the password that we just also retrieved. So here is compact database. So the next items on our to-do list are to make sure we have exclusive access to the database by checking for a locking file. If anybody else has the database open, there'll be a locking file. We'll know that we can't continue on. We also want to rename our database file. We're going to do those in slightly different orders here, and I hope you'll see why in just a minute. First, though, we're going to double double check to make sure that the file name passed in as our database file actually exists. If it doesn't, we're going to get out. So if the database file name does not exist, we'll go down to our end diff and we'll fall through sub exit and we'll pass a false back out. Assuming the database file name does exist, next we're going to make sure that the name passed to us is an actual database file. So we're going to look for .accdb in the file name. Again, if that's not the case, we're going to set it equal to false and we're going to get out. Assuming we have a file that exists and it is a database file, then we're going to decide what name we're going to use when we rename it. And that's very easy to do. Here's our database name. We're going to use the left function for length of minus six of the full length of the file name. That's going to subtract our extension and we're going to append to that dash old dot accdb. And that will go in this variable string backup file. Next, we're going to check to see if that file exists. And if it does, we're going to delete it because we're about to create it. We want to make sure that doesn't exist before we try to create it. Next, we want to get the name of the locking file. And that is simply the database name that was passed in. Again, minus 6 to get rid of the accdb. 
extension and we'll append to that .laaccdb. We check to see, again using it's the same function of directory function, checking to see if that file name exists. If it does exist, okay, if it does exist, that means somebody else is actively logged into that database and we well, will not be successful when we try to compact to repair it. So we're going to give a message box telling the user we can't compact to repair and we're going to get out. Next we're going to perform the actual rename. We're going to use the name, the VB name function to name this file as the backup file name we created right there. We're going to set another boolean value to true. Okay, we have on error handling up here, on error go to sub error. So if that rename was not successful, we would branch down to our sub error code. So meaning if it's successful, that means we'll end up with this line of code. Next in our task list is to perform the actual compact and repair itself. We do that with dbengine.compactdatabase. It takes multiple variables as inputs. This is your source file. This is your destination file. So source file is the database we want to compact. And this is has to be a different name. We want to give the compacted database a different name than our source. That way, if there's a problem, your source file is still unmodified and you can get back to it. So in this case, we've changed the name of our original database file to this and we're compact into the original name. Other inputs here, you want to give it a password. I, the, the, the database I'm using here has a password on it. So this last um, variable here, and it's a string, and notice there's a colon here at the beginning, colon pwd equals, and the db password that we passed in that we retrieved earlier. Again, we have on error code above here. So if there's a problem, we would branch down to our error handling. If yeah, backup credit equals true, compact successful equals false. We were not able to compact or repair the, the database file. We would rename this file back to the original. And everything should be okay because this file was not modified by the compact and repair. And this file doesn't exist because compact and repair had an error. If, on the other hand, we we're successful, if this is successful, we would make it to this line of code and we would set compact successful, which is a variable, equal to true. And then we're going to test to make sure we had a backup created and compact successful is true. We can delete that backup file, that source file. This you might want to rethink. Perhaps you want to keep your backup file for your users. That's fine. Do status equals true. We fall through sub exit. The Vibra function equals boost status, which should be true. Return to our calling code. We called it here. We place that true or false in X. We could test X. If X is false, we can give them a message that says there's an error compact in your database. If X is true, we give them positive verification with a message box saying that compact was successful. And that's the end of our code. I'm going to move some windows around so that we can see what happens in Windows Explorer when we perform this compact and repair. I'm going to slide this over here. Let's see if this will fit. Um, we'll slide an Explorer window in over here. That's too big. Uh, let's do this. Uh, not enough. There we go. Okay, so compact underscore BE. That's the back end that we're linked to over here. This is a very small back end database, so I think that when we press this button, it's going to go so fast we're not going to see any file renaming occur over here. But I think what we will be able to see is the date modified should change. It currently says 2:26 p.m. So let's go ahead and click our compact and repair. I didn't see I didn't see any renaming occur. There's our message box that says successful, but we do see the name uh, excuse me the date change here or the time change here 308 p.m. So that's it for our video. Thanks for watching. I hope you got something out of it and we will see you next time.